I tell you what, the joints jumping this morning with the Holy Spirit, amen? Yeah. Woo! That just, that just makes me feel so good. Buckers and buckrets, y'all want to start easing up the stairs? We got something for you. You want to go? Tell you what, I don't want to quit jumping myself. That selection song this morning was absolutely perfect in my, in my heart, in my opinion. We give glory to God in all, all types of ways of ministry and music, but when we can do it like this, and we have the heart pumped of everybody here, and knowing, knowing that God gave it to us, amen, and He's here with us. All right. I think most of them young is almost up there. I want to start this morning. We're going to be in Psalms. First chapter of Psalms, verses 1 through 6. I think this is pretty awesome this morning on the message that I'd like to share with you. Psalms 1, 1 through 6. I think it might be up there. Yeah. But I'm going to start off with a little story, fellow of mine. How did it help? How you feeling? I mean, that's another phrase right here. And also, I want to share something with you. Uh, last night, uh, yesterday afternoon, I was asked to be a part of a great celebration. And it was a marriage between a young couple, Chris and Reba. And that was the most beautiful wedding I've seen. And you know what really makes me feel good? Makes me feel proud that I know this young couple. They're here today. Just a second, and I want her to stand up and wait too because I I love these couple. They're a Christian, they're young Christians, and they're doing everything the way God asked them to do it. And that right there is proof in the pudding of what the Holy Spirit has for us. And I've got some friends out here that I hadn't seen in a while. Rowdy, Alvin. We got one row right here that's out of staters that come in. Y'all wait for hold in. Come on in here. Right. Join your new husband. This is the young lady right now. Yeah. We love you, kiddo. All right, enough all that. I, I can talk a long time. Y'all know that. Don't you say that? I'm going to share a story. I seen something on Facebook, and it's such a great story. And it's a, there's an old farmer, and I'm sure there's some of us in here, old ranchers, old farmers. But this young, this this man had a, a problem that's facing him, and he was sitting at the breakfast table, and he's drinking his coffee, and Grandma was there with him, but the grandkid was sitting around the table, and they was talking. The Grandma said, "Well, Grandma, I sure like to have some blackberry coffee." Them kids, when they asked, they get, you know. All the grandparents are doing this. Yeah. But they wanted blackberry cobbler, but the problem was their blackberry patch had done run out. Well, Grandpa, he knew. He knew what to do, because there's another patch on the neighbor's property just a ways down the road. He said, I'm just going to go over and surprise him. So early next morning, he got up with his little four daylight. He goes out to the barn, and he's got this little mule out there that he raised from, from a baby. And the mule's pretty well broke. You know how mules are. But this little mule, he called, he called this mule Faith. You know, he just did <clears throat> special to him. And he always made the, the comment, that you can't go bigger than a melon mustard seed. A little big thing, but all strength and power that this little mule had. So he said, all right, I'm going to go. He, he puts a pack saddle on this little mule. And he slips up there also on top of this pack saddle. He heads off across the neighbor's patch. And he's going to get some them blackberries for them special kids. Well, when he gets to the patch, so enough that little mule stands there like he's supposed to, he feels them, them panniers is what I call them. Ain't that right, Brady? Feels them full, pretty good load. And he jumps up on this little old mule and he heads back to the house and there's been word that in this country there's a mountain lion, a big cat running around him. Sometimes they get seen, sometimes he doesn't. Well, Grandpa was riding on this lot of trees and all of a sudden above him, I don't know how close it was, but he heard it. Oh yeah, the cat's still alive. And that little mule just took off like a scalded hound. Grandpa didn't. Chunked him over in the briar patch right there, big old bunch of briars. 
and he's trying to get out. He's having trouble. He's so thick. And that cat, he looks over across the fire path, and that cat's coming at him. He said, man, if there's ever a time to pray, right now is the time. And he went to pray, and I could have thought it. And you know what happened? That little mule had turned around and come back to Grandpa. And that little mule looked, lowered her ears, and she bared her teeth, and she run that cat from out of the country. Yes. And when he got, he got everything situated back, went to the house, he said, Hey, family, I got something for you. I got blackberries out there to make toddlers. And Grandma said, Well, man, I wish you hadn't have done that. We went to town this morning. And we bought us a bunch of blackberries, and I've already got it cooked. He said, Well, that's all right. I, I just I went anyway, and I thought that'd be good. And she said, Well, I hated that you wasted your time. And he said, Honey, I didn't waste my time. I didn't realize something. When you've got faith inside of the mustard seed, your prayers will be answered. <laughs> That's a little new. And you know what today in the message that I want to share with you, what we got up here on Psalms 1, 1 through 6, I'd like to read that scripture for you right quick. The way of the righteous and the end of the ungodly. Now, before you raise up your hand which side of the fence you own, let's go some of this, okay? Verse number 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scorning. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted on the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit to season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. I'm going to continue right here. The ungodly are not so. Now y'all look at this, but are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now that seems pure and simple, doesn't it? But it sure counts for everybody here. One way or the other. In, a, in this Psalms, and you know the book of Psalms is one of the longest books in the Bible with a hundred and fifty. And it's, uh, it's the psalmist, and he, it, it, the whole book is about poetry and music that David gave to the Lord. And it's a celebration. And this morning when I heard this music hit, I'm thinking of songs. I'm thinking of the music that we're, we're praising God with. But sometimes we don't know the melodies of these songs, but the words still are proved, proven true to the message they give. You know, always for Christians, it's a choice between two distinct and different ways to live one's life. Psalms is a, it's a magnificent gateway to the extraordinary ancient collection of Hebrew religious verses of the Psalms. It's often called the father of all wisdom songs. Psalms 1, chapter 1, divides humanity into two distinct classes. And that's where we're going to go. This is what side of the fence you're going to be on. Number one, for those Christians who choose to walk in sink or, or stand or sit with the wicked of the world, if you put on that side of fence, I don't care if it have it's your preacher. All the attempts to prosper in God's kingdom will amount to nothing more than that chaff blown in the wind I mentioned in the, in the scripture. Don't, all for naught. Number two, for those Christians who seek happiness and fulfillment through meditation and delight in God's instruction, they will stand firm, they will yield, and they will prosper. Amen? Amen? In the first chapter of Psalms, Christians are asked to examine the choices that you have made, that they have made, so they might answer this crucial, crucial question. And I want you all to think about this question and answer silently. <laughs> Am I living on the path that imitates the wicked ways of this world? <coughs> Am I imitating it? Or am I living in the path that's faithful and obedient to God's instructions? Pretty good question, isn't it? So, brothers and sisters, if you're living on the path of the wicked, it says in verse 1, Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. And mockers is the same thing as sinners. You know, where you at? The first verse begins by warning Christians how easy it is. Now, we're Christians. But it's easy. It's easy to gradually step back and to backslide or descend 
and take part of the wicked ways of the world. And since most would recognize and seek God's help to fend off any direct attack from Satan from the enemy, Satan chooses more subtle ways. Sneaky. That could not open the snot. He, he can figure out a way to get to you. And he entices us. He suffers a sin to be dominated by the world's views. Remember all we've heard this millions of times. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. Woo! He thinks that he's going he's to plant you here permanently. That's Satan. God knows better if we don't be obedient to our God. For example, even though Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was zealous. That means he just couldn't hard away. He stands up and over and under for God. And y'all heard me talk about over and under for the Lord. Anybody has not? Somebody please raise your hand. I'm going to tell you about this. When you're over and under for the Lord, it's like you're on a good pony. And you've got an old yearling or a heifer that's, or a cow or something that just took off and then all you in and on up to you are gone. And you've got to catch that stray, that runaway. And that's the way we do, you know, we're, we're hunting for strays and we're ministers. We are disciples of Christ. But anyway, you're on that good horse and you've got an eight foot long set of reins. And all of a sudden you're just over this way, and you're under this, and you're just making that old horny hind end catch up with his front end. So you can get a rope on that cow. Yes. Oh, look back here. Woo! I just got here to point out. Look on that picture on that where the girls are on the top. He is over and under for the Lord. Oh my God. And you want that you want that hind end to catch up with that front end. So you can get the shot. Turn the slack. Go back to like, the oh, like way Paul was. That's the way Paul was for serving God. <laughs> His love for the, for, the, for the traditions of the Pharisees didn't leave much room for him to serve Christ, though. He, but he was kind of at the time of his life when he was a little bit one way, a little bit the other. And he's helping Christ usher in the kingdom that didn't include the traditional Jewish symbols, symbols of the national identity, the Torah and the temple. That's back in the old days. And then you have Saul, the first kingdom. And Saul, he was chosen by God to be the first king. It, it talks about in 1 Samuel chapter 9. And due to the love of his position as king and subsequent fear, which we all have sometimes, of losing his army's admiration, we lose fear of our, our fear of admiration sometimes. He chose to disobey God and take plunder from the Amalekites. He done something God told him not to do. Disobeyed God because of what? The worldly views. Paul, his descent into evil was eventually corrected. You know, that's where we get that song. I was blind, but now I can see. Yeah, it happened. And it happens to us when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, as our Lord. He makes it clear. Neither Paul nor Saul, neither one of them woke up one day and said, Well, I think I'm going to serve Satan rather than serve God. That did not happen. Doesn't happen for us either, really. Yet, both ended up serving Satan. That happens to us also, doesn't it? Psalms 1 is a warning that that descent, that fall into evil, is gradual and often consists of three steps, three stages, which I want to tell you about this morning. Number one, walking in step with the ungodly. Number two, standing in the way that sinners take and stand. And that means joining them. You're not standing to prevent them, you're standing with them. Remember that old song, Aaron Tippin, stand for something or you fall for anything? That's where they're going right here. Standing in a way, number three, the sinners take, uh, standing in the company of mockers, that's number three. Sitting in the company of someone who calls themselves a Christian on Sunday and Monday they live like hell. You know, they're mockers, they're sinners. They haven't repented completely. They haven't come to, to want to know Jesus Christ. And that happened to us. Don't sit there in judgment saying, I know a guy like that. We were that guy once. Amen. Until we took Jesus Christ as our Savior. Hallelujah. Walking in step with the ungodly. Woo. You know, Saul disobeyed God's commands and orders, and Paul obeyed all orders. That, think of these two men. Men. Believe in men. They'll reach over and teach him. Teach him hard. That's what I'm talking about. Them men felt that too. They felt just like we did. They heard things we heard. They're, they can see things just like we see things. They were real people, real men, real humans. But God took them. He took them.
took them. They're just like us. Let him go. <laughs> he don't go nowhere. Not a single born Christian starts out being righteous. Amen. Satan, he's fully aware of that. And just because a person is justified, sanctified as a child of God, it doesn't mean they have fully put off the old self. There's a great song, The Old Man is Dead. When you can completely, fully put off the old self, bury the old man, then you've got it going. Then you're being obedient to God and you seek, you seek and desire to please God and be obedient. And love Him and give Him everything you've got. And it matures you into faith. That maturity is something else. Now, James 1 12. And as babies of Christ, you know, when babies are still on the milk, they can be kind of horn swallowed, enticed, or stuff it into do something else, can't they? Hmm. They give in to the evil desires that still exist in one's heart. When you're a young Christian, sometimes you're still on the milk. You haven't gone to meet yet. It's so easy to fall away. And Satan knows that. He knows each and every one of us. And he will try any and everything to grab a hold of you and keep you away from God. When the great deceiver, Satan, tempts a new Christian to sin, he's got to do some real sneaky. Or he runs the risk of being found out. And that person seeing his suggested behavior sinful through the power of the Holy Spirit might reject his suggestions. Where well, you at now? Are you on milk? Are you getting off to the beast? And you mature in your lives. And learning what God asks us, commands us to do. And giving Him our heart, our soul, and everything. Our God. Instead of using bold front up facing attacks, the psalmist warns the reader that Satan prefers to lure people to take advice or instruction from the wicked and in doing so, join them in their evil ways. How many times have you heard somebody saying something and you knew it wasn't right? But all of a sudden you said, well, am I sure it's not right? It don't sound that bad. Hmm. Maybe I could, maybe I could, uh, I'm going to try that a little bit to see if there are a right. You was lured in, right? Satan done it. The battleground begins first within the mind. And the more one sees Satan's world views acceptable as Christian behavior, the greater the likelihood one or more will abandon the righteous embrace of the world views. Is that scary? Oh, it's serious. It might be scary, but it's serious. You have the power to reject that. You have the authority in the name of Jesus Christ to reject that. But sometimes, who you with, who you running with, and influence you to the point where you say, mm, you know, let's go out and get us a beer. Well, all right, but I'm just going to drink one or two because I'm a Christian now. Well, I tell you what, if you're strong in your, in your belief, that, that, that person, man or woman, can go out and drink a beer. But if you're pretty strong, you can say, you know what, I think I'm going to get a cup of coffee. But you enjoy yourself right now. I'm going to be here. Let's talk. Is that hard? You doggone right as hard if you like beer. You go on right as hard if you like cigarettes. To smoke another cigarette when you got off of it. But Jesus gives you the power, the authority, not to. Where you at in your walk? Where you at? Even though a newborn Christian, he's not likely to run away from God's truth. They can be lured to take baby steps to be back in there. And to think in the safe way of living, hmm, some of it can be acceptable in Christian life. We'll give you an example. Most Christians believe that it's wrong to outright lie. Have y'all believe that? It's wrong to lie. How many of you have heard the phone ring and tell your wife and husband that tell them I ain't here? What's that make you? A liar. There, there's no one sin greater than the other one. A little lie, big lie, still a lie. Withholding parts of the truth, half truth. There ain't no such thing as a half truth. It's a liar, it's not. Are we guilty? We've been guilty. Amen. Anybody not guilty, stand up and say, me. Pastor? Uh, <laughs> you won't talk. <laughs> One might believe that it's wrong to commit adultery. Amen. It's wrong. But many Christians are convinced there's no harm in taking a kind of a long, lustful peak. Pornography gets you started and it doesn't let you go. That's lusty. 
a flirting, you know, you flirt with somebody else. Little innuendo, you, you know, you may be married. And you say things that's kind of flirtation to the opposite sex. That's wrong. It's wrong. It's okay to be a friend, give compliments, but when you're using that, you're trying to flirt with them and get them to kind of come your That's the world talking, brothers and sisters. And the devil's going, ooh, yeah. Bring it on, brother. One might believe that one should follow the laws of the land. Who believes that we should follow the laws of the land? Scripture. We should follow the laws. But who breaks the speed limit when ain't nobody there? Or when you're running like that? Don't be pointing, Mom. That's just a question for general. He's a lieutenant. One might believe that one should love another and find it acceptable to hate one's enemies. That's not acceptable. Not in God's eyes, not in God's words. While each of these small steps of accepting the evil standards of this world, it might not seem like a big deal, but once blurred and fooled, one can quickly find out your mind walking or dancing in sync with the devil, with the old self who should have been married. Amen? Glorify the ways of the world. The devil says, gotcha! When you get into that, gotcha! And if you keep it up, the Lord's going to say, yes, he did. God's not going to force you to do anything. But he asks you and offers his heart, his hand. He offers his love and he gives us, each and every one of us, his grace, which none of us deserve. But he gives it to us. Why? He loves us. We have the choice. Which side of the fence we're going to be on? We're going to love our Lord. We're going to worship our Lord. We're going to live for our Lord. He died for us. Amen. Pretty simple. Standing in the way that sinners take. That means partaking of it. That's in, that's in another part of the scripture I read a while ago. Once Satan has convinced a person to accept his or her mind in certain ways or acceptable Christian behavior, the next step is what? gives the person to start doing it, to, to be a part of it, partake. Remember, the battleground begins up here in your mind. And Satan will tempt the Christian to fantasize what it would be to act upon that evil behavior that they believe now is kind of acceptable. Well, there's lots of folks folk backsliding, amen? I've been there. I've been there. Anybody said they haven't, they're lying. But the truth sets you free. That's the truth in the Word of Christ and the promises God makes. While it's not a sin to have an evil thought, it's a sin to fantasize and glorify it. Amen? That's a sin. And it's, what, it's not a sin to admire a beautiful man or woman. It's a sin to lust and fantasize having sex with that person. That's the sin. It may sound raw to y'all, but that's the sin, that's the truth, and that's the way it is. Amen? Amen. While it's not a sin to have an angry thought about concerning another person, it's a sin to fantasize harming, beating the stuffings out of them, and killing that person. <laughs> Woo, now that's a hard for some of us, ain't it? Yeah, I'm going to lay hands on them, but it ain't biblical. <laughs> that's a sin in What we do, we want to pray for them. If somebody's starting some crap on you, you got two choices. Reach to them. They may or may not listen or walk away. But you love them. Your brother in Christ. You love them. You don't hate them. Let God do the, do the work. It's, pre it's precisely when one stops thinking about what's true, noble, right, and pure, or admirable, or praiseworthy, that Satan gets a stronghold into one's mind and it leads not only leads to sinful thoughts, but sinful action. And how many of us jump before we think? But with the, with the Holy Spirit and dwell in you. Go to anger. Quick thing. Quick listen. He settles you down. Psalm 46. Be still. You know that I'm Lord. That don't mean set your butt on that chair and shut up. That means you give it to Him. If something's bothering you, be still and know that I'm Lord and talk to the above all. He'll handle it for you. Christians often stand with sinners without any guilt or desire to repent. And as I always say, my four favorite words are right at the brand. 
for this type of person is riding for the wrong brand. But that brand leads straight to hell. Damnation eternal. Sitting in the company of mockers, sitting in the seats of sinners. Listen to this one. The last step Satan wants a Christian to take, Satan wants this to sit in the seat of mockers by defending. This is what we're seeing in our nation now. This is what we're seeing in our cities. Right here in our hometown. It's those who are defending and becoming pestilent teachers and tempters of their sins. Once sin becomes a habit, and it's a part of a person's character, most Christians naturally want to defend their actions when others point out their evil ways. Christians? The mocker is a fool in the language of wisdom. Proverbs 9, 8, 14, 6 talks about this. For he or she does not respond to instruction, but stirs up strife by his or her insults. While this seems ludicrous, like brothers and sisters, it happens. For how many Christians you know, do you know that truly believe in the entirety of God's Word? How many do you know that truly believe from front to back, the entirety, the truth, the power of God's Word? Do not most Christians throw out the very Word of God and convict, he, he gives them to convict them of their sins? Good not that you be judged. There's lots of scriptures in the Bible that people will change for their own benefit for their own personal desire. But the truth is the truth. Well, they certainly do this. Yeah. Psalms 1.1, the very first scripture, the verse that I wrote, it's a warning to Christians to not allow sin to become a part of their lives. Especially to the extent one becomes the trainer and defender of the evil ways of the world. Where are we seeing this now, brothers? We're seeing this worldwide. We're seeing this nationwide, statewide, citywide. And what I'm going to tell you is examples like pro-abortion. A pro-abortion. That's, that's giving our babies to bail. They are. You know, you're supposed to say the bail does. But it, it's, it, it's giving our babies up. It's sacrificing our babies. I don't care how you slice it, dice it, or cut it. It's wrong. It's abomination to God. Amen. That's our babies. It's involved. By, uh, bail wants them. That's evil to the most. Transgenders. How many times do you look on the TV and now the transgenders have that, a power play that they're going to be off the, like, I'm going to give you a good example. i got 72 of them running through my mind. But what about these men that think they're women now and they run in these races against women? How about these men, these power lifters, they get in the women's department? That's wrong. That's an abomination to God. It's not supposed to happen. The, it's the homosexual. It states here in the Bible. That's God's word. Homosexuality is a sin. It's an abomination to God. Period. If you don't like what I'm saying, that's tough. Because I'm saying the truth of what's in this book of God. Amen. I'm telling you the truth of what's in the Bible. Homosexuals, transgenders, pro-abortions, shack ups. I'm going to tell you right now. Shacking up ain't marriage. Marriage is meant to be between a man and a woman. Shacking up ain't married. That's fornication. It's wrong. If you're guilty of this, if you're guilty of these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the word. That's the truth in God's word. I believe it. And I don't care what the government comes to come right here now. If they say, you can't preach that, I'm going to tell them, yes, I can. You sit the camera chair. Listen. Amen. We stand up for God's word. Amen. I ain't put the cow down. I'm over and under for God. Yeah. Heck with them. I know what their future's like. I know what Satan's future is like because I read the book. Yeah. But what I'm telling you, all this, we have a choice. Which side of the fence are we on? What are you going to believe in? The results of being on the wrong path? Woo. Verse 4, not so wicked. They're like chaff. If the wind blows away, therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment. Don't fool yourself, brothers and sisters. Don't fool yourself. You will not stand the judgment time comes. Nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. It's not going to happen. You can listen to what I was telling about earlier. You can listen to these people that lie to you. Give you false information. Kind of bend the word of God around to where it suits them. And make it worldly acceptable. It's not. It's been tried since the beginning of time. It's been tried since the Garden of Eden. It hasn't changed it. It ain't going to change now. Psalms 1, 
4 through 5. This is an important message. We read that up here, and I'm going to share this with you. Christians, Christians who take advice from this world, stand with sinners and become mockers and expect the result of their service to God to be worthless. Worthless. It don't amount to a hill of beans. It's worthless. The psalmist warns the God tree not to imitate the ways of the wicked. For they're like that useless shaft that once separated the wheat is burned. For their ways are utterly worthless. In front of God, the wicked have no leg to stand on. Kind of reminds me of a state back in Genesis. You know what? No matter how hard they try, they will not stand within the assembly of God. God will drive away the wicked and no one will remember their place. Pretty strong. If only today's Christians could see this to be true instead of listening to the world who tells us that sin is okay, a little sin is okay, if they could see this. In little sin, that's a fast track to success. We'd see sin clearly as an admonition unto God and an impediment to bearing fruit in His kingdom. It's not going to happen through you. It's not going to happen through me. If we're on that wrong side. And we're serving Satan instead of serving God. Living on the path of God. Let's go back to verse 2 for just a second. But, who, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on His law day and night. Woo, now that's a happy verse for me. Meditate on God's Word day and night. That means my mind's always thinking about something in the Bible, something Jesus told me, something I need to do. It's always focused on the main focus, and that's Jesus. People sometimes say, you're a Bible thumper. She don't go right out of you. Yeah. You and I am. I love the Word of God. And I ain't I can thump with the best of them. That's awful. I'm a thumper. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not ashamed to proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I'm not ashamed or hesitant to stand up for what's right in the name of God. Instead of taking advice from the counsel of the ungodly, which only leads to sin and fruitlessness. The psalmist encourages God fearing people to seek advice from His Holy Word in the Bible. The law, or the Torah mentioned in verse 2, is reference to the Pentateuch, the book of Psalms, and the entirety of the Scripture. The entirety of the Scripture. Fruitful living is dependent on allowing God's instruction to saturate and renew. Woo! Have you ever thought about that way? One's mind. To the extent that one delights in the footsteps, following the footsteps of the Son, Jesus Christ. Instead of giving God's command, brothers and sisters, as a burden, this is where I'm getting to this, to restrict one's freedom, the fruitful Christian, the solid Christian, meditates and invites His Word to teach, rebuke, and correct and train His mind or her mind. Woo, I love that. And behavior and righteousness, so that he or she might be equipped to do every good work then ask that ask God that God asked them to do. 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm here. 2 Timothy 3.16. Write that down and go look at it later. As I said a hundred times, don't take my word for this. It's here. You can see the truth in the Bible. Also, the fruitful Christian knows that once sin becomes habit and part of their very character, the only way to identify them is such is through the lens of God's truth. It's precisely through obedience to God that Christians are set free. I mentioned that less than five minutes ago. And they're enabled to fruitfully serve and be firmly positioned in the righteous path of His freedom. Amen? Amen. Woo! Verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they prosper. That's me. I'm ready. I want to grow in God. I'm not where I need to be, but praise God, I'm not where I used to be. Amen. I'm walking forward. I'm over and under for the Lord. And I want to take as many people to the pen with me as I can. Psalms 1 3. Hmm. That's a wonderful promise, brother. Blessed is the one who finds joy in meditating and obeying God's word, for they will be like a tree planted, very much fruit. Obedience to God for the psalmist. Is an invitation to have the master gardener plant one near the spring of the living waters. Where you're going to be planted. Woo! 
It's a place where one can get nourishment, one needs to spiritually grow and flourish in His kingdom. Amen? The obedient are promised to prosper in all their service endeavors. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be rich. You're not going to be guaranteed to be financially wealthy. That's not what He's talking about. Or bear fruit always. But instead guarantees continual, continual, always well-being in this life and fruit in the seasons appointed by God. You know, that's pretty good, isn't it? If a person meditates, prays, thinks, and talks about God's Word, his or her actions will be godly. And his or her God-controlled activities will prosper. And that is, come to their divinely directed fullness. God's direction fulfillment. Is this not exactly, is this not whatever Christian ought to strive to obtain? Well-being and fruitful life? Yes, it is. If you're a Christian, yes, it is. If you love the Lord and you're walking for Him, I'm gonna close with this. In chapter, in verse six, it says, "The Lord watches over the way of the righteous." Plain and simple, the Lord watches over the way. The psalmist finishes this chapter by again contra contrasting the pride of the righteous and that of the wicked. Which side of things you know? Which direction you know? There's only two ways to live. For those Christians who have joy in meditating. And obeying God's word, they'll like be, be like a tree planted by the workers. Mm. Prospering in what they do. For those Christians who seek advice from the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, who sit in the company of mockers, then any service, any service to God will be futile, blown away like the chapter in the wind. It's far north. It's not going to help you one bit. It's not going to save you. It's far north. Notice that there's not a third path we're talking about with God. But we say there's not a third path. One must choose either to obey God and be blessed or follow the evil ways of this world, which we're in right now. And it's not this, it's bad now, but it's going to get worse. That's the promise. That's a promise in the Bible. And we have one service destroyed if we follow that. Like the psalmist, I will leave you with one final question. It really sums up this chapter. This sermon today. Which path are you on? Which road are you taking? There's only two. Let's go for one prayer. Father, thank you for this message. Stir and move in me like it did. Brother, I hope that the Holy Spirit just impounds this message in, a, in my brother and sister here today. Whether we are where we're supposed to be or not, Father, uh, that can change in the blink of an eye. Father, we know what we know. And that is to be obedient to you. To love you because you have a never-ending agape love for us, Father. And it's my prayer that we all walk forward. We all proclaim you. And we all bring people to know you. We're disciples of yours, Father. And I ask that you enhance us and enrich us in our ability to reach out to all, to reach out to others. Not to be ashamed. Not to back up, but to go forward boldly. And Father, I pray that my brother and sister here study more, study more, endure the truth, and, and, and fill our fill our spiritual need, Father, of, of knowing what you say and what to do. This Bible, Father, your book, your book better to us. The Bible, basic instruction before leaving life. Or leaving earth. Be happy and leave. Father, that's so important. Be with us and yearn and desire to follow your word. And Father, if somebody here today has not made that crossover, has not received you as Jesus, seems to receive you Jesus as your their Lord, their King or Savior. That person, whatever he has found, can never die close. Pray this prayer. Pray this prayer and say to God, Father, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I can't live this way anymore. I will not. I don't want to. I'm, I'm, I know what's going to happen if I stay here. And Father, I believe. I believe with all my heart and soul you came to this earth, this old stinking earth, for me. You came as God in the flesh for me. And you took that punishment on, on the cross and before you got on that cross and all that ridicule and persecution, you took that for me. And Father, the reason you did that, Jesus, I know that you died on that cross, and in three days, you beat death. 
and you ascend into heaven to prepare a place for me as you say in your words. Father, I need you. Please, wash my sins with your blood. Wash them away, please. Father, I need a fresh start. I need a new start in life. Let me marry the old me and live again, live in you, in you, with eternity. I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, brothers and sisters, for being in on this message.